Thank you everybody for being here. We're running slightly late, but it's fine. It's only four minutes and we're allowing everybody to be in. Hi, Pippa. Hi, Philip. Hi, John. Hi, Matilde. Hi, Sarah. So many people joining us because we have a great, great guest today, Torsten Meissner. He is senior lecturer in classics, philology and linguistics, fellow and director of studies in classics at Pembroke College, Cambridge University. Where do I begin? A crude list of his Achievements cannot do justice to how much Torsten is contrib contributing to making Cambridge a global centre for Aegean studies, but I'm sure if you're here, you know this. Torsten is a linguistics titan. He is the author of STEM nouns and adjectives in Greek and Proto-Indo-European, a diachronic study in word formation, which came out with Oxford University Press, and other really um, impressive recent publications include a great article on reading linear A entitled From Linear B to Linear A, The Problem of Backward Projection of Sound Values, written with Pippa Steele and published in Understanding Relations Between Scripts, the Aegean Writing Systems, edited by Pippa Steele, and also Linear A and Linear B, Structural and Contextual Concerns in the Aegean Proceedings of the 14th Mycenological Colloquium from Copenhagen. And he's also written very many contributions on Mycenaean spelling, Mycenaean linguistics, Indo-European, the nominal composition in Mycenaean Greek with Olga Tribulato, many more contributions on linear A, Mycenaean linguistics, as I said, and linear B. On Cretan hieroglyphic, which is the focus of his seminar today, may I give a preview? With Torsten's and Matilde Civitillo's permission, may I say that we are editing a volume on this script on Cretan hieroglyphic called the Cretan hieroglyphic script in context, which corrals all new and some old ideas, but some new views on the topic with preeminent, really preeminent scholars in the field. And it is a pleasure to have Torsten today with us. On a personal note, I am so excited, I couldn't wait for this moment because he's really venturing into new research. Our next scribble will stick to the Aegean. We're gonna be sticking around the Aegean and we will have Nicoletta Momigliano from Bristol presenting her new book, In Search of the Labyrinth. Uh, it will be on the 13th of May, which will be uncharacteristically a Thursday, but we didn't want to overlap with the Mycenaean seminar, but more news on that soon. Torsten, the floor is all yours. We can't wait to hear more. Well, um, um, it's a great honor um, to be able to speak, uh, but I'm afraid um, I will in all uh, likelihood um, disappoint you. Now, anyway, let's make a start. There are not many places on earth that uh, can boast as many scripts or writing systems, and I use both terms loosely here, uh, occurring uh, in such a small space as Bronze Age Crete can. So here on this first slide, you see a, a sample of what um, Crete has to offer here. Now, the illustrations um, are arranged not in any chronological or uh, schematic order, but simply so as to make best use of the available space, with the central motif, Crete, in the middle. So uh, starting from the very top and then going clockwise, uh, you've got the Archalochori axe, then some uh, early Cretan glyptic, uh, then a Cretan hieroglyphic, uh, the infamous Feister's disc, uh, a linear B tablet, and finally a linear A tablet. There are also uh, not many places on earth uh, where the actual interpretation of these scripts, be it iconographic, semasiographic, phonetic, historical, societal, their mutual relationship and historical development is fraught with as many difficulties as precisely these Cretan scripts. Yet uh, their allure is irresistible. And when Sylvia kindly asked me to give a talk, it was a clear case of uh, middle-aged naivety and frankly stupidity on my part to suggest that I should speak on Cretan hieroglyphic. Of all the big Cretan Bronze Age scripts, uh, by which I mean Cretan hieroglyphic, linear A and linear B, 
Cretan hieroglyphic is, to my mind, clearly the most frustrating one, as it presents all the difficulties that I have just mentioned. Let us just remind ourselves uh, what we are talking about when we say Cretan hieroglyphic. Now, the Cretan in the term is uncontroversial in as much as Crete, and um, Crete alone is where this script was used. The term hieroglyphic, on the other hand, is highly charged and an implicit or explicit comparison with the writing system employed by the big neighbor to the south at the same time can be unhelpful as it might influence our expectations as to what the script should look like, how it should function, what sort of non-linguistic baggage it should carry, etc. It is well known that in Egypt, the number of literate members of society was very much limited and strictly controlled. One of the various ingredients that made the hieroglyphs a hallmark of power. We lack any comparable information for Crete. And I think, therefore, we should be very careful when making assumptions here. We cannot read Cretan hieroglyphic of the three big Cretan scripts that I mentioned, it is easily the least well understood. And this too has consequences for the approach to the script that scholars have taken. Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A do chronologically overlap, but uh, there is also a lot of uh, distance between the two. Now, first of all, the supports and nature of documents. Nearly half uh, of the evidence um, for Cretan hieroglyphic comes from seals like this one or seal impressions. And this in itself constitutes a massive difference uh, with both linear A and linear B where this is all but absent. But above all, it has considerable consequences for us. Sign sequences are necessarily short, shorter even than in linear A. The direction of writing is often unclear as is that of the intended order of the sides of a multi-faced seal. De Corte, for example, has recently pointed out that the direction of, the <clears throat> direction of travel on seal Sheik 315 needs to be revised. Sheik, uh, for those who don't know, is uh, the standard publication, see um, uh, Corpus Hieroglyphicarum Inscriptionum Cretae, edited uh, by uh, Jean-Pierre Olivier and Louis Godard. We must also at least allow for the possibility that some signs are rearranged, as they are in Egyptian hieroglyphic, for special reasons, such as visual effect, thematic focus, or simply best use of the space available. Inseparable from this is the question of the purpose of uh, the document. Seals are meant to make an impression. And this fact has been widely and divergently exploited by authors. We will return to this very soon. Then uh, there is the chronology. I said that there is overlap between Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A. But on the whole, Cretan hieroglyphic is earlier, with the beginnings in the middle, in the early part of uh, Middle Manon, while the bulk of attestations uh, seems to belong to Middle Manon 2 and 3, with some discussion regarding some particular deposits. Linear A, in its majority, uh, at least as far as the administrative tablets are concerned, belongs to late Manon 1A or 1B, with the notable exception of uh, Festos, whose tablets are ascribed to Middle Manon 2B, and Malia, whose tablets seem to belong to Middle Manon 3B. The latter is particularly important as Malia is the only place that has thrown up uh, sizable finds of both Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A. But crucially, uh, the Cretan hieroglyphic seems earlier with the finds from the so called Cartier Mu dating to uh, the end of Middle Manon II, while the palace deposit may date from the same time or from the first phase of the Neopalatial period, in other words, the beginnings of Middle Manon. 
3. What all of this means is that Cretan hieroglyphic has elements of both the earlier pre-writing Manoan glyptic and iconography on the one hand, and those of a fully fledged writing system that we see in the linear script on the other. And again, this is used by different authors to set up very different arguments. I now want to come back to the seals. Their intricate and elaborate nature and extensive use of motifs found in the uh, uh, in Manu and Glyptic combined, at least in some cases, with their materiality and their likely use in official contexts, has inevitably led to the view that whatever the linguistic message on a seal, if any is intended, there is a clear metalinguistic message here, which, given the common but unproven assumption of widespread illiteracy, will have been of greater importance to anyone confronted with the seal or, more saliently, its impressions. Now, some scholars um, like to speak of uh, the consumption of writing here. I personally find this term unsatisfactory as one consumes uh, an inscription neither like a drink nor indeed like a marriage. But needless to say, my own aesthetics are in entirely irrelevant in this matter. In order to make this point about the non-linguistic message of the seals, pretty much every single publication on the topic illustrates this um, by showing um, this very Jasper seal, or to be more precise, side D of the four-sided Prism seal CRS4402, chic number 295. Now, no one can deny the visual effect this has on the beholder. It may also be that uh, some seals were not meant to be used in an administrative context at all. Uh, that some seals uh, have a magic talismanic function, and others may just have been decorative and essentially being used as jewelry, which in which case, of course, symbolism, aesthetics, and other non-linguistic factors may have played such an overwhelming role that even searching for a linguistic message may be misguided. But even where we are certain or reasonably certain um, that there is, we must be very careful when it comes to projecting our expectations here. Now, I hope it is not completely misguided to look at seals and sealing practices in medieval Europe for a moment. Here, royal seals appear from the 11th century onwards. By the 12th century, the bishops also had them, and by the 13th century, they were commonly found in the lower classes as well. What about the language? Now, as you might expect, Latin was the dominant language for the inscriptions, but both French and English are attested from the 13th century onwards. The inscriptions, often operating with abbreviations, usually state the owner or the institution to which the seal belongs. So here, for example, um, we have uh, the seal of um, King uh, Rudolf I and uh, the inscription uh, running um, uh, round uh, him right, uh, sitting on his throne uh, with the royal insignia, uh, the scepter in his right hand, the orb on the left. The inscription says uh, Rudolphus Dei Gratia Robanorum Rex Semper Augustus. Right, entirely typical, but uh, sometimes uh, instead of name and title or titles, you find a motto instead. And occasionally you get something rather unexpected. So look at this seal here. This seal, uh, dating from the 14th or 15th century, uh, clearly shows a squirrel. The inscription around it reads, I crake notis, I crack nuts, so prepare for the unexpected. What is clear is that in my talk, I'm not cracking the nuts presented to us by my known seals. Let us for a moment move away from them. Until the early 1990s, the seals presented the majority of um, the evidence for Cretan hieroglyphic, or to be more precise, seals and 
impressions. 832 signed attestations um, um, versus um, 732 on other documents on clay. Um, that's the number of script signs um, that we had up until the 1990s. Subsequent finds at Petras have changed this somewhat, but seal and sealings still make up uh, the largest single document by far. In fact, though, these statistics uh, are potentially misleading. For if it is true that there are different types of seals, administrative and non-administrative, meaning uh, talismanic and purely decorative ones, then it might actually be important to distinguish between actual seals and seal impressions. But we would not necessarily expect to get clay impressions of talismanic or decorative seals. If there is a palpable difference in the signs one gets on seals on the one hand and on seal impressions on the other, then one could at least better formulate such a hypothesis. So um, then um, you go back to Cheek and other publications and try and um, sort out seals and seal impressions. Now, uh, as it happens, 58 different signs are found on seals. When I say 58 signs, I mean signs as codified by the standard edition Cheek. 19 of these signs, almost exactly one third therefore, are not found on seal impression. So a priori, there could be a case here, and it is interesting to note that with one uncertain attestation of sign number 63, there are, as far as I know, no instances of a sign found on a seal impression that is all, not also found on the seal that we have, suggesting that the number of 58 different signs is about right. It is not clear that we should have missed much here. But of the 19 signs missing from seed impressions, 16 occur on incised clay documents. This means then that there are very few signs that are exclusive to seals, not therefore supporting the hypothesis that they have a special status, at least as far as the standard signs are concerned. Four signs uh, are exclusively attested on seals. Um, 14, uh, the donkey's head, occurring five times. Uh, 48, which looks like a bow and arrow, or at least a bit. A hapax, um, 76, which occurs three times. And then 95, attested exclusively in the infamous so called Archeanis formula, which we are going to look at later on. None of these is attested elsewhere in Cretan hieroglyphic, nor do they appear to be forerunners of any sign or signs found in Linear A or Linear B, at least not clearly so. 95 has been argued to be read as Ra, and that may well be right, but it's not easy to see uh, how um, 95 can be the forerunner of um, the standard uh, Ra sign that we see in linear A and linear B. It's not totally excluded, but it's also not obvious. I should also say that uh, for the linear A uh, sign representations, I unashamedly avail myself of the pictures available at uh, Esther's excellent uh, linear A paleography website, Sigla. It is impossible in this context not to discuss uh, what is clearly the most contested sign here the cat's head or cat's mask. This sign shares uh, with um, the other uh, ones that we just saw, the fact that it is not attested in any other uh, Cretan hieroglyphic context. However, <clears throat> it differs from them in a number of important ways. First of all, it very clearly is related to uh, the cat mask sign uh, in the linear A and linear B um, records and in linear A, and linear B, um, this sign, AB80, stands for ma. In other words, it's a syllabogram. And this syllabogram, ma, also, of course, features very prominently in the ligature maru in linear A, meaning wool, which in linear B eventually turns into a logogram. And I refer you to Vasilis uh, Trakis' publication um, in the matter. This by itself could suggest uh, that its non attestation on clay documents is due to chance. However, this is not so simple. First of all, it has repeatedly been pointed out 
that the cat figures very prominently, prominently in the iconography as well. In other words, we might uh, not be dealing uh, with a phonetic sign at all, but rather a more symbolic one. And this interpretation might then explain the fact that it isn't attested on other documents. Secondly, that this sign, the cat sign, sometimes seems to follow what is often called a formula. Formula, a big word for what is in fact um, a fixed sequence um, of a few signs, two or three signs. So like this one here, uh, number 44, the pet shark seal, and number five, the eye. This uh, is a well-known um, and frequently attested sequence um, appearing just by itself. So um, if on uh, sheet number 295, uh, sign delta, we get this sequence and then the cat mask, then uh, it is clear why some scholars argue that this is just uh, decorative or symbolic and should not be interpreted in the same way as the other. Now, a very detailed and balanced discussion of the entire problem is found in uh, Matilde Civitero's book, and it is clear uh, that you can argue um, both sides here. Now, Yasing and Younger have both argued that the sign should be accorded its phonetic value, and indeed on John Younger's admirable website, the identification of the cat's mask with the phonetic value ma, as in linear A and linear B, is called certain. So what, if anything, are we to do? The importance of the cat in Cretan iconography is incontestable. Seals like this one, where the cat has center stage, uh, show this very clearly. Some scholars also then point to Egypt, where several deities, um, Mafted, Bastet, and Sekhmet, are depicted with uh, cat's heads, right? cats of different uh, kinds and sizes, as you can see. Um, and the deity Mut is both depicted with the cat's head and as being accompanied by the cat. So a powerful religious association has been suggested here for the Cretan depictions as well. And yet, to my mind, there is an important difference here. On the seals, uh, where it is found together with other characters, what we find is not a depiction of the whole cat, but only its face. And this could potentially matter. For this seems to me to be exactly the sort of standardizing procedure by which a graphene of a writing system is created um, out of, a, uh, of an iconographic symbol. Now, add to this that in the sequences where it occurs, that the cat's head does not take center stage. Okay? It is not uh, located in the middle. There is uh, quite simply nothing particularly decorative about it. To be fair, uh, on the other hand, there's one marked instance um, where you just get the cat's head, uh, as you can see here. So uh, you look at the um, third um, uh, side of um, the, the seal. Um, that is uh, Sheikh 283, side gamma, um, where the cat's head seems just as decorative as the animal iconography on side delta. For example. The cat's head is found four times in a row. And of course, it is uh, as such unlikely to render the word. And again, look at uh, this um, Lama de Fas um, from Malia, which is clearly an administrative document. Now, call me unimaginative, but I find it hard to argue for a decorative value of the daggers here. Now, maybe the uh, two documents are not comparable, but uh, in the absence, of any meaningful knowledge of the administrative practices, we simply do not know. But even if so, then I don't see any contradiction in the sign having uh, or being intended to be read with a phonetic value, while the sign in a different form or in a different configuration could have a value outside of that of a writing system. But back to more general things. I said at the beginning that there can be no doubt that Cretan hieroglyphic has a strong iconographic streak to it. But I think the decorative hand can also be overplayed. Given that we can't read the script and know almost nothing about the language it renders, 
um, even if that language is the same as that of linear A, that our knowledge of the administrative practices is likewise extremely limited, that we don't know what the linguistic information on the seals is, or even how it works, do they render full words, or as is often the case on seals, abbreviations, or indeed both, I don't think then it's a good way forward to declare everything that doesn't seem to make sense to be decorative. May I remind us of the fact that all early modern attempts to decipher the Egyptian hieroglyphs failed because the would-be decipherers believed that the hieroglyphs represented ideas, are not sounds or words. It was only Athanasius Kircher in the mid nine, sorry, in the mid 17th century, who argued that the hieroglyphs could function phonetically. Now, um, much of his work was full of esoteric ideas. He was a Jesuit priest and as such uh, had a fair few of such ideas. And for uh, these ideas, he was ridiculed, ridiculed even at the time. But he was actually uh, the first um, scholar since knowledge of the Egyptian hieroglyphs had died out, who argued correctly that Coptic was derived from the ancient Egyptian language. Um, and it was he who actually correctly identified one Egyptian hieroglyph, the sign for water, which he compared to the Coptic word mu, meaning water. And he thus ascribed uh, to it the sound value m. Let's get back to Crete hieroglyphic and let's get back to basics. The exact number of Cretan hieroglyphic signs is not clear. The standardized list gives 96 different syllables. It may well be, however, that this list needs to be pruned somewhat. Whether 62 and 63 really are two different signs can be doubted. To be sure, there are no shared sign sequences across these two. The individual words, if that's what they are, um, are all different. There is a strong tendency to be observed, though, as much as that uh, 62 is more frequent on seals, while 63, with one exception, occurs on clay documents only. Schick also lists uh, this sign as a logogram, attested only once, but there does not seem to me to be an obvious reason for separating off uh, this, this off uh, from uh, 63. Now, Younger also plausibly argues, for example, that 74 and 75 are not actually characters, but numerals, and that uh, 61, likewise, is not a character, but a separator. And the same may be said for 66. Contrary-wise, there is no guarantee, of course, that all actual signs are tested in the record that we have. Don't forget, we haven't got um, that much evidence for Cretan hieroglyphic at all. Now, be that as it may, the overall number of signs seems to be around 90. Now, this number is very close indeed to the number of characters in the linear A and linear B scripts. And that Cretan hieroglyphic, in essence and in principle, is a syllabic script just like linear A and linear B, is, in my view, not open to doubt. Of these, as we have seen, 58 are attested on seals and their impressions. The number attested on clay supports seems much higher in the region of 90. But if we subtract the signs about which uh, one can be doubtful, and um, then also <coughs> take account of the fact that a good number of the ones uh, attested only on clay doc documents are Hapax, 79, 80, 81, 84, 86, 87, 89, 90, and 91. Or indeed, um, could be logograms, number 78 would um, seem an obvious example. The difference uh, between seals, uh, so the number of signs attested on seals and sealings on the one hand, and those on clay documents, gets much smaller. Uh, however, uh, sign 87 uh, has a clear parallel in linear A, sign uh, 301, and it does show that we need to take the signs seriously all the same. Even if there uh, still is a difference between uh, the number of signs attested on seals and uh, 
on clay documents, respectively, 58 signs occurring in clearly phonetic sequences is simply far too high a number to claim that this is not a fully functional syllabic script. What does this mean uh, for our cat's head then? The fact that to all intents and purposes, it looks like an ordinary sign on the seals, though the iconographic tradition of the cat is clear and still very much evident in them. And the fact that Cretan hieroglyphic on seals is a fully developed script should, in my view, give us the confidence to treat this sign as a phonetic sign and see in it the forerunner of linear A, linear B, ma. Now, the fact that it is not attested uh, in Cretan hieroglyphic on clay, but is very much attested in linear A, um, is a problem. But um, it is more readily explained as an accidental gap. But it has to be said the opposite view is also not impossible, namely that the cat's head does not yet have, uh, uh, does not yet have been, uh, been given uh, a phonetic value in Cretan hieroglyphic, that there is another sign out there that has the sound value ma, and that the homomorphic linear A stroke linear B sign ma comes from a slightly different tradition. But then we would be faced with a, a most curious situation where we actually have the morphological sign in Cretan hieroglyphic, but the sign and the concomitant sound value only in linear A. And I thus uh, prefer the view uh, that uh, it's non attestation um, on clay documents is an accidental gap in our transmission. But still, we can't stop here because uh, it must also be mentioned that Ma would thus be a suspiciously rare sign. Now, Sheik lists only five attestations of the cat's head in sequences, <coughs> but um, given that they don't regard it as an actual sign, this list may be incomplete. And there are certainly a few more instances on the seeds that can be discussed in um, this context. Nevertheless, the sign remains rare and indeed perhaps too rare for comfort. In linear A, uh, ma as a syllabogram occurs uh, 94 times uh, out of about 7,400 linear A signs in total. Now, some of uh, these uh, instances of ma may be logographic, namely where the sign stands by itself. If we subtract these attestations in linear A, we are somewhere in the high 80s. And that means that the sign has a frequency of about 1.2% of all linear A signs. Five attestations in Cretan hieroglyphic out of about 1,600 signs is about a quarter of that. And also the uh, putative Cretan hieroglyphic ma is all too readily found with well-known sequences like 44, 49, and 44, 5, which we have already seen, which are normally standalone sequences. But 5, um, 44, 49, 44, 49, 23, on a Lama du first, and a few other combinations are also attested as sequences, so maybe this is not an unsurmountable obstacle. And in any case, I think it would be very unwise to conclude from this discrepancy in frequency that Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A are used to record two different languages. Now, speaking more broadly, I find that the concentration on the decorative character of the Cretan hieroglyphic script puts the distance between it and linear A. And although there are, of course, massive differences between the two, I think we would do well by concentrating on what they have in common. Now, to claim that Cretan hieroglyphic as we have it is the direct ancestor of linear A, that may be right, but the road is indeed rocky. The number of Cretan hieroglyphic signs that formally correspond to signs in linear A and linear B is somewhere in, well, in the region of 20 to 25. And clearly, at least some of these correspondences are in the eye of the beholder. Now, two main routes have been followed in establishing the correspondences and therefore ascribing sound values to Cretan hieroglyphic signs. Now, first of all, morphological similarity. That Cretan hieroglyphic sign 42 corresponds uh, to linear A and also linear B. A is, I think, 
uncontroversial, as is the identification of, for example, um, 24 as ni, 31 as re, 41 as wa. That sign uh, 7 should be ni, on the other hand, seems possible if um, we take the upward strokes uh, on the left and the may to be an indication on the fingers, but certainly no more possibility. There is, I think, a sliding scale of plausibilities and people will judge individual cases differently. Now, the second avenue of ascribing sound values is uh, created by trying to identify sequences that recur in this or a similar form in Kenya A. The most famous example here is undoubtedly the Arcanis formula, uh, 42, 19, 19, 95, 52, or rather 42, 19, and then separately 19, 95, 52, um, as the sequence is never written continuously, but always segmented in this way. As in this example, starting from the bottom right. Now, the reading uh, 42 as A seems uncontroversial, as I said, and to identify 19 as Sa also seems uh, quite promising. Now, the ensuing reading A Sa Sa then strongly evokes linear A A Sa Sa Rame, or more frequently Ya Sa Sa Rame, but we know uh, E to be a separable uh, prefix. And this sequence, asa sarame and yasa sarame, occurs on the linear A libation tables. Some people, illegitimately, it seems to me, have drawn the conclusion from this that the linear A on the libation tables is written in a different language from that of the administrative documents. The equation between the Cretan hieroglyphic and the linear A sequences in general seems so strong that one really wants this equation to be true. Now, SA95 shows a great variation in, in its representation, right? but it is very hard to derive uh, linear A ra from it. Now, at the same time, we should not forget that 95 occurs not just on seals, but only in this very formula. It is a very isolated sign. Now, it would be astonishing not to have Ra, which is abundantly frequent, um, attested on other seals, ceilings, or clay documents. Now, this very sign sets the Arcanus documents apart from the entire rest of Cretan hieroglyphic, and we do indeed therefore need to be prepared that there were slightly different strands of the hieroglyphic writing tradition in operation, which then begs the question, what Ra in the remainder uh, of Cretan hieroglyphic look like. Younger uh, suggests uh, maybe sign 27, which morphologically, morphologically looks better. Look at sign 27, looks uh, more promising as an ancestor of linear A Ra, but it seems impossible to gain certainty here for the moment. Uh, problems uh, also very clearly when trying to read sign 52 as meh so as to equate it with Asa Sarame. Both Sheik and Bryce notice the similarity between um, Cretan hieroglyphic um, 52 and linear A and linear B, ne. That looks uh, a lot better. John Younger uh, then uh, ingeniously notes that on Knossos Vet C7, we get a ne in final position in what looks a bit like our formula. But the problem is that uh, this, uh, what we read on uh, um, this uh, linear text from uh, Knossos, ya uh, sara anane, that uh, this sequence is either deliberately garbled, in which case we should read me, which in turn means that we're running into serious epigraphic problems, or indeed the Arcanis formula 
does indeed end in ne, in which case it quite simply isn't asa sarame. Now, in the absence of a proper understanding of the morphology of the language, we simply don't know. The second example, the identification of sign 56 as ku, as found on uh, Yami's website, is based on the interpretation of the sequence 5670 as kuro, which occurs as the totaling word in linear A. Now, in Cretan hieroglyphic, this sequence 5670 <clears throat> occurs a few times on administrative documents. But unfortunately, it is not always found at the end. And it is also not necessarily followed by a number. Here, uh, on the example I've given you uh, on this slide, it is found at the end, Kuro, but we also have an additional Ro, which we don't get in the linear A totaling formula. And clearly, the number 12 does not total all the entries. Now, morphological equation of Cretan hieroglyphic uh, 70 um, as the same as linear A rho is evident. The linear A sign looks practically identical, but 56 looks nothing like ku. Although in uh, Zaklos, there's one attestation of ku, um, it's in, in Zaklos uh, 20, that looks at least a little bit closer to Cretan hieroglyphic sign 56. Now, interestingly, the sequence in Zakros at the very end, where it looks like, um, says kura. Now, the totaling formula is kuro, and indeed, this totaling formula kuro is also uh, attested at Zakros. But uh, the large number of 130 in kura is suggestive. Now, true, Kura also recurs in uh, Arcanis um, once, where it has nothing to do with totaling, uh, but uh, also the sequence in uh, Kura and Arcanis may well be something completely different. Back to Cretan hieroglyphic. The identification of 5670 as Kura makes sense, and if it is right, then we might, as Younger suggests, want to seek a different origin for the Ku sign in Cretan hieroglyphic from that in linear A. Now, overall then, what we get is a mixed bag. A third route for identifying Cretan hieroglyphic signs has very recently been opened by uh, Nosh and Ulanowska in their important and elegant work on the materiality of the Cretan hieroglyphic script. They argue for and illustrate the central importance of textile production related reference on Cretan seals in general and in the creation of hieroglyphic signs in particular. The loom sign, 41, had long been identified, but they suggest much more here. The flax plant is sign 31, for example. I recommend the article to anyone interested in script creation in general, and Cretan hieroglyphic in particular. And for the final part of my talk, I want to take their work as my starting point for what is admittedly some wild speculation. But I'm afraid that's what, uh, that's, uh, what Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A do to me. They uh, take 62 and 63 together uh, and seen as uh, the depiction of a spindle with a whirl. Depending on the technique employed and the type of whirl and individual preferences, the whirl can be at the top or at the bottom or somewhere in the middle of the spindle. Can we identify a corresponding sign in the linear scripts? A potential candidate is sign AB70, which stands for Ko. In its representation, you have a circular top part sitting on a narrow, elongated, slightly double cone shaped lower part. The bit on top is almost always drawn as a full circle, indicating that we are really talking two different objects here. Now, morphologically, that would work quite well, I think. I should also say um, that, however, <clears throat> um, that uh, for sign 62, an identification as uh, AB06 na has been proposed. But uh, that would uh, probably preclude taking 62 and 63 as one the same sign. Um, and I also think that uh, 62 is actually far removed 
from AB06, the sign for now, um, that has always a long horizontal bar on the top and then uh, a sh shorter bar or dot underneath it. Underneath it. Now, the question is, um, can we further motivate the identification of um, Twitter hieroglyphics 62 and 63 with COR in linear A and linear B? Now, we do know uh, that at least some of the syllabic signs are clear acronyms, and as, uh, such as perhaps most frequently AB, the sign for knee in linear A and linear B, which also occurs in Cretan hieroglyphic as sign 24. This is also the logogram for the fig. It stands as an acronym for the word Nikulion, according to Hermonax, one of uh, the types of fig in the Cretan language. We are fortunate to have the gloss in Athenaeus, Hermonax and Glotais Kreticais, Sukon Gene, Anagrafe, Amalia, Kai, Nikulia. The discovery of which gloss we owe to the great Günther Neumann. Any such luck with our spindle? Now, the Greek word for the spindle is atraktos, whose origin is unexplained, but it is self-evident that atraktos is not an uh, uh, acronym. So the, that atraktos cannot lead acronymically to co. Now, what exactly is a spindle? In English, in textile terms, it is what we've just seen, but uh, the term is uh, used across languages for similar looking or similar functioning objects. So in English, the long metal bar going through the door at the end of which sits the doorknob is called spindle. Or um, beautifully, in German, for example, the inner axis of a univalve shell around which the exoskeleton is wound is called the spindle. Now, bearing this in mind, I think there is a plausible candidate to be found in the Greek language. The word for the pegs with which the strings of a lyre are tightened and the lyre thus tuned is collops, or colopis, which has no clear Indo-European etymology and is a word that really does not look particularly Greek. The word already occurs in the Odyssey, where it designates the peg on Odysseus's bow. This word also has a variant kolabos, which is found in some later writers, namely Lucian and the philosopher Iamblichus, and kolapes in Hesychius, which is glossed as hoi kolaboi perihus hai kordai. So uh, kolapes are called the pegs around which are the strings. Now, this type of alternation or a ah, in the vowels, and in particular the alternation p versus b is well known and in Greek and found in a great number of cultural loanwords. Now, this word is also uh, inseparable from scolops, scolopos, which means something in pointed pole, palisade, or prickle. And again, the alternation skur versus ker has many parallels in such loanwords. And speaking of the lyre, the Greek word lyra itself has no etymology. And just like kithara, very much looks like a loanword. I point out in passing that the sign for ru, rendering lu or lu, the sign AB26, um, uh, and hieroglyphic sign um, 92, looks a bit like a liar with the support. In conclusion, then, I propose that uh, Cretan hieroglyphic 62 and 63 um, uh, are the spindle with the world as identified by Nosh and Ulanovska. That this is reflected in the linear script spy sign AB70, ko, which made it into Greek as a technical term, the specialized use of the word the spindle, named the lyre peg, which does not just look like a textile spindle, but also rounded strings are uh, wound in the same way as thread is wound around the spindle. Moving away from textile terminology, another lexical field that has a distinct role in script formation is that of weapons or sharp instruments. I have already mentioned um, uh, sign 42R, that uh, this may stand acronymic, uh, acronymically for um, the word that in Greek is reflected as aor, is not a new suggestion, but in any way it is the double axe. Very many terms for weapons in Greek have no etymology, and the word aor would be a good candidate here. Uh, more examples are sign 43, which chic uh, equate with linear A sign 364, and linear, the linear B sign for so, and um, Greek hieroglyphic sign 45, which gives uh, linear A, B, sign 74, 
In linear A, this is only a test, it has a logogram, but in linear B, it has its sound value, say. I would like to propose one more in this series. Let us look at um, CH51. As a logogram, this sign made it both into linear A and linear B. As luck would have it, we actually know the Mycenaean word for it, hakana, which is fasgana. Now, tra traditionally, this word was translated as a sword. In Homer, it is a weapon used for close combat. And Mycenaean has shown that it is smaller than a sword, a dagger. Once again, no Indo-European etymology is even remotely in sight. And that we are dealing with a loan word is obvious and further strongly suggested by the fact that alongside fazg, we also get svag in svadzo, svage, which is normally loosely translated as to kill. But if you look closely, you can see that in Homer, it is always used for killing cattle by cutting the throat. In other words, just what you would use the fazganon for. And there, I think, we have it, hiding in plain sight. I think that this sign thus had a double history. It survived practically unaltered as a logogram, or indeed it could have been remade practically at any time. As a syllabogram, it underwent some moderate changes. If we look at the earliest attestation of the sign in linear A, namely in the Festos record, dating back to middle manual to B or so, we can still uh, very clearly make out the pommel at the bottom, the cross guard in the middle, and the blade at the top. Now, the blade has undergone simplification from two lines to one, just uh, like the sign for sheep in linear A starts off with two legs, looking at the sheep from the side, but then gets simplified and is reduced to one leg. And that is, of course, the standard generic form which linear B inherits and is widespread in linear A from various sides already, though the two-legged sheep remains in use for female sheep. And also, of course, um, when you look at uh, the blade from the side, uh, this is what it would look like. But this early shape of pa is also still seen in uh, Aya Triada, but the bottom knob quickly develops into a second stroke of the same length as the one above it, giving us the familiar shape of the pa in linear A, which is then the sole variant that makes it into linear B. Now, there are still many gaps, and there remain good reasons to think that not all real world sources for signs are identical in linear A uh, and linear B on the one hand and Cretan hieroglyphic on the other. Of course, what I have presented to you may easily be the phantasmata of an unbridled mind steering a ship that is crashing at the skiller of Cretan hieroglyphic or the Charybdis of linear A. But I still think that if we use all the tools that we have, archeological, epigraphic, iconographic, historical and linguistic, and if we can combine the arguments, we can make some progress here. Nothing underlines the importance of the textile industry for the Minoans, I think, better than the powerful allegory of the thread spun by Ariadne, which was to be the lifesaver for Theseus, and nothing symbolizes their beliefs a mite more than the double accidents. If these two combined can help us out of the labyrinth that are the Cretan scripts, then one day they will truly have fulfilled their purpose. Thank you very much. Thank you, Torsten, so much. I'm sure that there are lots of questions and let's get right back into the labyrinth because I am sure this is going to be quite lively. I'm going to leave my questions till last, if you don't mind, because I'm sure that there are some interested attendees that want to ask their own. Tilde, you raise your hand, all yours. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Torsten, for this awesome talk, particularly on the acronymic principle at work in defining the phonetic value of some, some signs. You are not presented phantasma, phantasmata, in my opinion. <laughs> but coming back to Cretan hieroglyph, I would like to know your opinion on a precise point. I'm talking about the four potential syllabograms that, uh, as you said, are attested on seals only, not yes. on clay, nor on any other material. 
uh, in my opinion, these special signs can, could point to the remarkable specialization of this erratic system when appearing on seal stones. Yes. And its significant alterity in respect to its use on other written supports. It is perhaps worth noting that these rarely attested signs recur on some atypical seals. For example, the potential syllabogram 14 is used in a Habak sequence on the face beta of Sheik 2094, made of white steatite, already signaled by many scholars for its unusually long faces and other, other varieties like the repetition of some signs, and on the face gamma of the unique golden seal we have ever found in an apex as well. Uh, on the face beta of these special seals, special golden seal, moreover, is engraved another potential syllabogram, uh, 77, um, 76, again in an apex. So I guess it is interesting to note that these special signs are attested for writing hapax legomena, mm -hmm. namely their rare lexical entries on seals generally made of semi-precious stones and in one case of gold. That could be just a case that on the only golden prison we know, certainly an outstanding high culture artifact strange enough because not bearing any formula as on the majority of four-sided prisms where there were engraved two different hapax sequences for which we we'll use two on the four rare hieroglyphic syllabograms we are aware of. They were uh, consciously chosen as precise graphic variants considered more suited for the content of descriptions perhaps perceived as more archaic or prestigious. Uh, it is not infrequent in, that in a writer communi writer's community, there were in use contemporary different written varieties. And this condition is perhaps more similar to biglossia than to bilingualism. And between the two different variants, there will be a difference in connotations and prestige. So it could be tentatively the case also for the potential syllabogram 95 used always and only in order yes. to write the uh, Arcanes uh, formula. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so it, uh, do you think it could be tentatively hypothesized a sort of graphic loyalism for some words rooted in ideological and cultural reasons? As I was writing the talk, um... At the end of that, I came to the conclusion that really um, we should we should separate completely uh, Cretan hieroglyphic on seals from that on the other documents, right? And the uh, uh, Cretan hieroglyphic on on clay documents, in so many respects, looks much closer to what to, to linear A, right? In, in in not just in their appearance but also in their purpose and 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 and, and what have you, right? So. Um, uh, in a way, it doesn't help us because it 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 creates even more barriers. Right, where I would like to see fewer, right? Um, but uh, um, yes, um, therefore, perhaps not just different strands of a writing tradition, right? But also, indeed, um, different attitudes, um, as you as you say, uh, um, uh, perhaps just graphic loyalism, archa archaicity. Maybe, um, uh, maybe uh, I, well, if only we knew. It could also, um, it could also be uh, that um, it records a different language or dialect. I mean, we must not be fooled by by certain sequences. I mean, if 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 um, if, um, for example, um, um, we look at at English. Uh, and if we just look at, for example, uh, the end of, uh, of a totaling record, and if we find this the word sum or total, uh, we could be fooled to think right, that English is a form of Latin if we have no idea okay, of, 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 of what they said. So we, we, uh, uh, so, uh, we must be prepared for the existence uh, of uh, words that occur or sequences that occur both on seals and in administrative contexts, right? 
and still cannot conclude from this that they need to record uh, the, the same language. So what I'm trying to say is, I don't know, right? I don't know. It, it may be just as you say, right? It may be just as you say that um, there is a uh, 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 clear uh, graphic archaism here. And of course, in C on seals, there would be an obvious reason, right, to, to, to do precisely this. And, um, uh, uh, and uh, if you just want to write something quickly on, on, on a clay document, right, that you choose uh, a reference, real word reference, like beginning with the same uh, um, uh, with, with the same syllable that, that looks uh, that looks completely uh, that, that like looks completely um, looks completely different. Um, um, what should we make of this? Yes, if only if only we knew. I mean the um, uh, the number of the or the number of sequences on the seals is so frustratingly small, right? That it is really hard to know, right? But um, uh, but uh, and I also haven't thought enough about it, right? But I, I think um, I think it's um, uh, uh, what would you say may well be true, as you say, or there could be other factors as well that separate the two. But I think um, I think there's good reason to think that um, uh, that Cretan hieroglyphic on seals is morphologically or linguistically. Uh, different from the Cretan hieroglyphic on, on, on the I, I, I wanted to ask my questions last, but I'm going to just try to jump right in. I think it's very right of you, very, very tantalizingly so, to bring some unease into the way that we're looking at the Cretan hieroglyphic as if it were, you know, sort of a cauldron that doesn't have significant radical differences. Mm. And I think it is high time and it's been done in recent years with a very sort of vivacious, lively um, attempt, uh, successful by Roland de Court, by you know other people, to see whatever it is that's engraved on the seals as a different thing from what we have on the documents, yep. on the clay documents in Greek and hieroglyphic. And I think this this unease is very welcome because. It brings about the possibility that what we're looking at is quite different from an internal point of view. And you seem to have suggested at the beginning that there is, again, it's not sound and solid evidence, but there is a direction in which we could put into question a phonographic internal um, writing when it comes to the seals, the engraved seals. And I second that, you're preaching to the converted there. I've been thinking that for years and I know that Judith has been, we've published on this. I mean, there is tantalizing evidence, the mm. pointers that lead in that direction. And, um, and that brings about the question of the Arcanist formula, which I think to a large extent should be deconstructed without um, having a close association that is a sign by sign related to linear A. And I'm very happy to see that you flagged two signs that clearly quite don't fit. Yeah. And so I think I that has implications in the way that we look into development of Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A and their internal relations and whether they do uh, register to different languages and all of that, which or not, and all of that, which which needs to be a future direction for research. And I am sure that you know there will yeah. be attempts to. Well, this is not really a question; it's more of a sort of a, a prompt for a discussion or a yeah. board for more discussion on this because. There are so many take home, take home messages that we can uh, that we can actually take home, but also deconstruct to an extent. And I think your um, your your views, as speculative as they may be, are grounded in a very present um, need to look at that in a, through a different filter. Mm. So I I do welcome that. And I'm, uh, well, yeah, but yeah, yeah but. but. It I'll, is, come, I'll, I'll come to my question, Torsten, yeah. because I don't want to take too much space and I'm sure that other people want to ask more questions. I mean, iconicity, iconicity as a, a sort of a 
as the starting point is, a, is fraught with problems for, for so many reasons due to arbitrary readings, arbitrary interpretations of what the signs do actually represent. Uh, everybody has their own ideas on this. And obviously, from a theoretical stance, it needs to be structured in practice to be applied. And maybe that is my question. How do we go about fixing the firm boundaries that take us a step further forwards into, into making assumptions as to what the signs do represent from an iconic perspective? We need, we need some sort of you know, solid uh, architecture to start from. Uh, and that's why I actually uh, very much welcome the work done by Marie-Louise and Agatha in UNESCO, right? Because they, they, they try to find, um, they try to find, I would say, um, lexical fields. Okay, so um, um, uh, the the um, textile um, the textile terminology. I mean, I've, and you, you, it's easy to see why um, textile and the textile industry should occupy their their, their, their minds um, very much. Well, granted, of course, much of it uh, has to be entirely speculative. And um, um, what you have heard uh, 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 are the products of of, of a very much a wandering mind. Um, but if we, I mean, but 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 my method is then um, trying to um, plausibly identify um, um, the morphological shapes, right, okay? uh, and then try, if possible, to tie this to um, um, words that are loan words in the Greek language. Okay, this is not a guarantee, right, by by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, but it seems to me another avenue. Uh, to, uh, and it always has to remain speculative, okay? But it seems to me in principle, in principle, uh, an avenue by which, uh, or that we can go down in order to, um, um, to ascertain sound values and then the objects. And of course you may, may, uh, may, may believe it or not, but I think, um, um, uh, but, but I think, um, uh, well, of course I'm a linguist and that I want these things to be, <laughs> Uh, to be so right, but in, in, in principle, that, that strikes me as a, as, a, as a reasonable way of going about things. Okay, now yeah. I, I have a further question on that, but let's leave the floor to Andreas Fools. You can unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you, uh, Dawson, for this extremely interesting presentation. And um, I am concerning the question of um, parallel writing systems in Crete. First of all, I'd like to ask you if you also consider, how do you con um, con arrange or consider the Faisal's list writing system in relation to the Cretan hieroglyphic writing system? Yeah. Do you think they, they are parallel di distinct systems or um, share the same writing system? Um, um, I I've made a rule of my life. Um, to steer clear of the uh, of the Faistos disc, um, uh, I, of course, I do realize that one can't, right? If one doesn't want to be accused <laughs> to be accused to be uh, used to being a, a, a coward. Um, now, the honest answer is, I really don't know. I'm not sure, right? You look at this damn thing, right? And um, um, and make sense of it. I mean, um, Brent Davies uh, uh, has um, recently uh, tried to argue that because of the collocation of the uh, sign uh, sequences, the language uh, of the uh, Faustus disc may well be the same as that of, um, of Cretan hieroglyphic, which in turn is the same as that of linear A. Right? Um, the, uh, I, I think, I think, well, what do I think? Um, there is a danger of circularity here. So, as is as is evident with the interpretation of the Arcanis formula, um, right? You want it to be true, and then you see um, you, then you see the parallels, but the parallels don't really quite work. Um, the um, and the, like I see identification of Kuro, right, uh, can also easily become circular. Um, the I mean, to, to come back to, well, but to come back to your question, um, I don't think that uh, on the basis of um, this one document, I can make a, a decision on, on whether or not um, uh, 
they are the same. Uh, is, is it the same writing tradition? Well, um, <laughs> possibly, possibly. Um, I mean, we have to, by, by just looking at what we see on the seals and on the clay documents, we have to admit for a considerable variation uh, in the hieroglyphic tradition. And I don't think it is entirely excluded uh, that, um, so that uh, say, if I can put it crudely, South Coast Korean hieroglyphic right, looks very different from uh, Northeast Coast Korean hieroglyphic. If, I don't know whether that makes any sense. Um, but um, these are just musings. And uh, I think we're really uh, very much in the realm of speculation. Yeah, thank you. May I add um, just one one statement for this um, comparison? Um, I'm I'm an engineer, so I'm analyzing sign sequences statistically. Yeah. And I have um, compared this, uh, the sign frequency distributions on the file systems as well as on grid and hieroglyphic writing yeah. system, independently of each other, and against um, a, a dozen and more other known writing systems um, to, uh, to make a cross um, writing system comparison. And then I see that both the file systems writing systems and the grid and hieroglyphic system um, behave in the same way that they indicate um, let's say a phonetic component in the sign list of about 60, 65%. So that's um, based on the comparison with known writing systems, of course. So yeah. um, this kind of statistical analysis um, indicates that they are um, in terms of the sign frequency and the way how the signs are used, um, probably they are related much more closely than um, only based on graphic similarities. There, shall, there are some similarities in the same, in the same using the similar signs, but of course you're right. Um, okay. it's, it's only a few. Yeah. But th this is this is uh, uh, also precisely what what um, uh, um, uh, how Brent Davies uh, 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 asked the question. So you, you may want to talk to him. Any more questions? You can raise your hands. Theodore, would you like to unmute yourself, please? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. Um, looking at, thinking about the cat's head, cat's face sign, AB80, hieroglyph, whatever. Um, looking at the, the hieroglyphic attestations you kept popping up, um, it occurred to me that the way it's drawn in hieroglyphic with the focus on the eyes and the ears, it looks more like the linear B sign than a lot of the linear A asset attestations, which are very triangular and schematic. Um, and I don't, not to suggest that like, there's direct influence from the hieroglyphic sign on linear B, but I wonder if that similarity or aspect suggests or um, tightens the connection between the signs with linear A in the middle and does suggest that it is best read as a, um, as a actual syllabogram. Um, yeah, again, if only we if, if only we knew. I mean, um, the type of linear A that was the uh, uh, direct uh, model for linear B, of course, uh, is precisely in in an area of Crete where there's so little evidence, right, for 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 for, for, um, for linear A, right. Uh, but you're right. I mean, um, uh, uh, um, the uh, Mark on the linear A tablets. I mean, it's very frequent, very frequent sign. Right? It's, it's, it's so it's much more schematized than than uh, it, it is uh, in in, uh, in uh, linear B. Uh, and in, of course, uh, but then again, linear A scribes uh, uh, do not win prizes for handwriting. Let's face mm. it. Right? Mm. Um, the, uh, uh, the the mass sign is is not an exception. There are very very many signs that that uh, uh, if you want to pass an aesthetic judgment. Um, are very sloppily drawn in linear A right, compared to compared to linear B. But I say that the 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 the, um, the, the, the real problem uh, it seems to me is is, is the dearth of um, uh, of evidence uh, from Knossos uh, uh, and the surrounding area for linear A. Right? That would help to settle that question. 
Very true. Any more questions? Judith, you had a comment and question in the chat. Is this a, did you want to ask a question? Thank you very much for a stimulating paper and very much the sort of thing that uh, Sylvia and I have been working on for the last two, three years, and which we've published a couple of articles and others are impressed, uh, where one of the things we've been doing on the seals, the Cretan hieroglyphic on the seals, is attempting to show by, that you can deconstruct many, but perhaps not all of the so-called formulas. And if they are not phonetic, then uh, it looks as if we can think of them as logo, uh, logograms or even in a few cases, possibly determinatives. But this is work still being done. Uh, on the other side of the coin, of course, there is the way that hieroglyphic seals have been used in Minoan administration. And I think one shouldn't get too far away from the fact that they were being used in what looks to be a very structured way. In other words, not just perhaps identifying a person, but identifying ranks, offices, institutions, it's, it, that's open for endless debate. But when you look at the way seals are used, for example, in the Knossos hieroglyphic deposit, which is what, where we have the most of them, it's clearly structured and it's clearly integrated in some sense with the kind of script that we then see on the clay documents. So you get, for example, the crescent ceilings, which have one, two, three, and more sometimes uh, seal impressions on them, uh, sometimes repeated, uh, sometimes not, and usually, almost always, with an added inscription so that I don't think one can really split them quite so firmly, uh, the seals from the clay documents. This is not to say that the signs are used in the same way entirely, but it's, it's something to keep in mind that they did actually use these things in administration and it is structured in some sense. It, y yes, indeed. Um, uh, and um, uh, I mean, uh, the, both the seals and the uh, clay documents are, in a way, administrative tools, really, aren't they? Right. So, um, um, and uh, therefore, uh, in, in that respect, need to be seen and treated together. Right. But it could still be the case that the actual writing or the writing traditions behind them is slightly different, right? Between the oh, two. I'm sure they are quite different, but yeah. not entirely different. No, of course not. No, of course not. I mean, there. I mean, for sure. I mean, um, there, there are, there are uh, um, strike similarities. But what, what, what? As I was um, reading on uh, writing this talk, I was just against my own will, um, persuading myself that uh, they are not as unified as I'd always thought they would be. Okay, and then they, and then they could be. Yeah? I think it's so, not in the opposite direction. <laughs> sorry. I think I have gone in the opposite direction. Have you? Okay. <laughs> Perhaps most. No, I I treated I treated it as an un, I'd always treated as as an uh, as an, as an undifferentiated whole, undifferentiated whole, and it isn't right. As it, I mean, as they they are. I mean, I, and I'm also I have to say I'm more skeptical um, uh, about the sort of um, putative talismanic use of of of, of, of seals. I mean, it's it, it's um, it's um, it seems to be an, 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 an uncontrollable assumption to make. Right. It's possible, right? But it's uh, hard to, to control this, I think. Um, right? So I, I, um, I still prefer to see them as primarily administrative tools. Right? And indeed, uh, the very fact that um, uh, the, the sign that uh, Evans uh, um, identified as a trowel, I mean, is, 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 is perhaps actually the seal itself, the Petschaft seal uh, itself in, in hieroglyphic, right? um, uh, might just feed into this. Right? Um, but um, uh, the, 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 the writing the, the, that, that doesn't that does uh, does not preclude that uh, that you could actually use two as a let's call it two different scripts or two different notation uh, uh, or recording uh, 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 characters sets of characters um, uh, depending on the type of uh, surface that you use if that makes any sense any more questions I just had a very quick question I don't know if it's your field of expertise or not, but I was just wondering, 
Um, has the field of computational linguistics contributed much to our current understanding of creating hieroglyphs? And has it got much to offer um, to advance our understanding? Or is it well, still uh, a work in progress? Uh, you, 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 I don't know whether you see the, uh, I mean, um, um, certainly statistical analyses, uh, like uh, the ones uh, um, done by Andreas Fultz and, uh, and, and Brad, Brad Davies on, on a very large scale, right? Uh, yes, they, they have contributed. Um, it, right, but um, but 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 right. um, the sample set that you get is very small, right? Very very small, right? The total number of uh, um, uh, tokens, right, is tiny. Okay, so I'm not uh, I can't judge to what extent um, uh, um, uh, 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 to what extent um, um, you can therefore make uh, good pronouncements. But perhaps Andreas would like to come uh, back to this and and. Um, and uh, Fill us in. Um, yeah. Um, not, more than I, not much more than I can say on that. Any more questions? Sure, thank you. Miguel. Um, thank you, Thorsten. Mainly, I would just like to say that it is, it is very laudable that you give us this talk and that we are talking more about Christian hieroglyphic because it feels like it's one of the scripts that has been um, less explored recently and there is so much to do and um, I would emphasize as Sylvia did the, the, you pointing out the issue with the Arhanes formula and especially the problems with those two signs at the end yeah. with regards to, to the, the parallel with Asasarame and Linear 8 because the, the comparison or the equation even with Asasarame has been in the literature since I think Bossert in the 1930s and it has become a, a bit one of those things that everyone takes for granted and perhaps it should be uh, a little bit more questioned and I wonder I think but well we not have. just me we have we have <laughs> we have we have wondered um, we have wondered uh, whether the, we would do the same comparisons if we didn't have that thing in the back of our head saying this is Asasarame. So when we looked at sign 95, um, would we still think of it as a sign to be matched with linear A Ra 60 or something else? And what Sylvia was hinting at is that uh, we have a paper actually coming out in press. I think it will be uh, a few weeks or months till it comes out in the annual of the British School of Athens, where we, we propose something different. We propose to compare the sign with um, linear A uh, 10, sign U. But it's not so much that new comparison that matters, but the fact that we have, we can find a better formal or morphological, as you said, a better morphological match for that sign. And we can find a better formal match for the last sign in the formula. And it makes us wonder, are, are we really to treat this as a matching sequence or should we revise our assumptions? Yeah. And um. so in that sense, it is, it is very laudable that we're asking these questions. And I would, I would, jump immediately from here to the, the second point I wanted to comment on, because um, I think that with current data, uh, that is considering not just the material published in Cheek, but also the material from Petras and new, pub new published inscriptions, I think that now we should have, off my head, about 10 or 11 sign groups on the seals that have also matches on the clay documents. So here I would tend to agree with, uh, with Judith. Uh, maybe there are some things that point uh, towards treating them as different things to an extent, but they have a lot in common. And we also see um, seal sealing uh, clay, inscribed clay documents. Um, so yes, and conversely, if we remove the the Arcanist formula as a match with linear A, we don't have any match at all, any sequence 
of Krypton hieroglyphic matching with linear A. So there you go. You have two scripts that look very different, linear A and Krypton hieroglyphic, one or no matching sequence. But within subcorpora of Krypton hieroglyphic, you do have sign groups that match and even ones that repeat a lot. So yes, this is this is essentially what I wanted to, to stress out. But thank you, congratulations. So, yeah, well, uh, I mean, um, um, uh, you could read you could read um, the second part of the Arcanis uh, formula then as something like Saune, um, I suppose. Right? Um, right? But uh, that uh, does not, to my knowledge, give us a word attested in, 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 in linear A either. Right? But um, which doesn't uh, uh, is in a way neither here nor there, okay? But mm. uh, um, uh, but uh, um, okay. Uh, I want to. Right, I, I, it seems to me that that uh, the entire our kind of formula indication with Asa Sarame right is more wishful thinking than anything else. Right? And um, uh, uh, that we still have shared sign sequences. Um, uh, yeah, it's true. It partly uh, depends on you accepting uh, the uh, description of certain sound values for uh, certain Cretan hieroglyphic terms. I mean, like, you know, like Kuro, for example, right, about which I'm um, perhaps more skeptical uh, than others, right? Um, but some, uh, some, psych some sign sequences may remain. But we still have to be careful. It's very hard to draw any conclusion from this. If there are names, okay, then you can't say anything, right? I mean, or what I'm trying to say is, right? I don't think we are at a stage where we can say, uh, based on this, uh, whether um, they are recording uh, the same language or two different ones. Now, personally, if you ask me, right, I very much tend to the view that they record the same language, right? Um, I, I, in fact, I don't see room for much else, but, but I don't think you can prove it on the basis of the Well, unless you do a statistical analysis uh, of the percentages of the frequencies of the signs, and in that way, you can see how they are distributionally placed yeah. and you can do positioning i mean of course uh, we 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 actually to answer also the question from david if i remember correctly you can do to an extent some computational things on Cretan hieroglyphic vis-a-vis -vis linear a you're very right to send that the material is very scanty of course but there's, there's still some room in which you can play yeah, around yeah. And, yeah. and and i think there are ways in which you can uh, maybe not prove conclusively, but get closer to uh, comparing the two in terms of the distributional sequences, frequencies in the sequences and positional um, distribution of the signs within the sequences. So I, I think there's room there. I want to be positive and optimistic when it comes yeah. to that, which which opens up, uh, well, a horizon. Well, I completely agree. Yeah. I, I completely, yeah. Yeah. Yes, and so once you do that, you can actually get closer to uh, maybe not answering the question fully, but questioning whether we are dealing with in more likelihood with two different languages or the opposite. And that can open up a discussion, of course, and more probing, but th there is room. I, I want to be optimistic over, over this. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy that you brought about emphasis on the Arcanist formula, not quite matching the linear A um, libation. It, of course, this has implications, right? Uh, uh, for yeah. sort of the geopolitical drawing of lines, as it were. So in that way, if we need to dismantle the Arcanist formula, is it a thing on its own, a self-standing thing being so formulaic and not quite matching the formula that we have in linear A? Or can, can it be embedded in the Christian hieroglyphic tradition being the first attestation that we have of writing on the island? How do we see relationships? It, Sorry, it's my question. It's, it's, it's it's like <laughs> That's a big question. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> that is a big question. Yes, how do we say relation? As well, um, uh, God, um, the right. I, I. I'm sorry, look, you don't have to answer. I mean, do no, we it's, have? It's, you know, uh, I just want oh, your opinion. I mean, what, what can we say? I mean, there's just so much that we clearly don't know. There's so much evidence that we do not have. Okay. Um, right. Um, 
uh, Crete uh, was a hotbed of experimentation with with, with writing. Right? They, they, uh, I mean, as I said at the beginning, like, like very few other places right? on, um, uh, on 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 Earth, right? And um, what uh, happened, say, between 1800 and 1600, right? Mm. Um, right? Um, well, I would have loved to be there, right? But, um, <laughs> right? Um, is potentially so enormous. I mean, as I say, I mean, you could even see two entirely different hieroglyphic uh, traditions emerge, okay? Um, uh, and as the um, morphology of the signs and the attestation of the signs on the seals on the one hand and the clear documents on the other shows, right? Um, 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 there is, right? And, and these, and both used in the same place, right? And then, right? Uh, uh, but um, 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 there, there's so much room for, for well, um, development and movement. And from our vantage point speculation that, um, uh, it is just very hard to say, isn't it? I mean, I, I, um, I still think we should try and be as reductive as we can, um, or be as reductionist as we can, right? And see as many parallels and things in common, mm -hmm. uh, rather than, uh, rather than, um, I mean, just, as, as Esther has shown, I mean, um, uh, in her work, I mean, um, um, even calling, the, the later script linear A and linear B puts a puts a division in place, right? That in many respects is not justified, right? Mm -hmm. um, right? And uh, I, I still believe, in spite of uh, some things that I said earlier, that, that we must try and, and be as in, encompassing and unifying as we mm -hmm. as we can in our approach, because the, to go the opposite way to say, well, this is this. Uh, uh, this sign or this particular form, this sign uh, comes out of strand A. This out of strand B is sort of C of a uh, Cretan hieroglyphic, right? Um, that may be right, but it uh, is uh, not necessarily helpful. Okay. No, I was hint hinting towards the yeah. same direction. To be honest, I, I think there are ways in which you can be more inclusive. Yeah, definitely. Any more questions? Well, we have about. <laughs> Hello, if I may. Of course, of course. Late. Um, okay. Thank you, Thorsten. Um, just a moment. I'm trying to fix my screen. Okay. Um, um, my question goes back to the first part of your talk when you very clearly uh, explained that um, Cretan hieroglyphic repertoire is still a matter of dispute. And um, I think, in my opinion, uh, in order to establish which signs um, are to be included in the repertoire in the writing um, intended as writing signs, uh, we should be first of all establishing criteria to distinguish between yeah. writing signs and decorative or filling <laughs> motives. <laughs> and, uh, and this is the big question, oh, which oh, are the, the criteria question. we should follow <laughs> in order to distinguish between this mass of um, symbols of decorative or science. Um, from the example you, you presented us, the cat mask, um, I deduce the following, and I would like to ask you if you could confirm this criteria could, apply, could be applied to all other cases uh, or not. Uh, so I, I deduce four criteria, which should be uh, the inclusion, meaning the sign should be included to, to, in order to establish that this is a, a writing sign and not just a decorative motive, that it should be included um, on a written uh, seal face. This means that um, second criteria position, it should be uh, next to other writing signs and calibration, meaning the sides of the uh, of the sign of the suspected sign should be more or less the same as the other uh, Cretan, more secure Cretan, Cretan signs. And um, this sign should have a parallel, a comparison, a development in a linear, a, in a linear sign. 
Um, uh, what do you think yes. about the yeah, yes, yes, yes. I mean, the, these are the criteria that I implicitly at least applied, right? And these are the ones mm -hmm. that I I I, uh, I I I could think of. I mean, there are others as well, um, uh, uh, namely the uh, the um, positioning of a sign. Okay, so uh, can it occur um, at what seems to be the beginning of a sequence, middle of a sequence, or the, the interior of a sequence at the end of the sequence? And I think that's that is an important uh, factor as well. Actually, now, of course, uh, some signs are um, restricted by nature. So signs for pure vowels right, uh, will occur only or almost only uh, at the beginning of a, of, of a word. But of course, uh, the sign for the cat's mask, uh, uh, if it is indeed ma, uh, would, not be, uh, would not be this. So we might a priori, uh, without knowing much about the language, of course, right, but we might a priori uh, expect this sign to be able to be used right, in um, internal, medial, and final position. Okay, so uh, uh, that would be another criterion. Um, uh, but we uh, don't. It's completely uh, scrambled. It's, yeah. The distribution is completely scrambled, so we don't have that neat pattern. Sorry. We don't have a neat pattern in the in the frequency of the of the cat mask. It can be at the beginning. It can be in the middle. It can be in the end. At the end, um, it, it doesn't have a sort of a. a a homogenous kind of distribution within under seals within the sequences. Yeah, but that's a good thing, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. For rewriting sign, yes. Yeah. No. <laughs> it's not just, um, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, no, I'm the problem is that the customer says you. There's also the question of the orientation. I mean, um, right? Mm. Uh, so is it straight? Is, is it not just much? Um, uh, uh, I, I don't think that's a meaningful criterion because uh, you, you, I mean, if you look at the seals, right, uh, the, the, the signs can, can be uh, uh, rotated. Yeah, yeah, can be rotated. Yeah. Mm. So this should not be included as a criterion. Uh, Distinguish uh, between decorative and writing yeah. sign. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I don't want to take much time on this. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? I'm really interested in the rotation of signs on the seals, actually. <laughs> I would keep you here till late, Torsten. I'm not sure. Yes. <laughs> why, not, why not say it? Um, Torsten was talking about, should we then read Saune? And maybe the big question is, should we are we them? sure we always should try to read everything phonetically? Because there, there, there have been many works of course, recent literature that have hinted at this issue. Uh, comparatively, we know that early invented image-based uh, writing systems like written hieroglyphic, uh, well, we don't have any exception of a system like that that not only spells words phonetically, but also logophonetically and logographically. Yeah. So I, I think we should really think of well is something else possible and have a look at that assumption yeah quite right quite right right but it's um, um uh, uh, but unless you are able to define a strict criteria as to when to read something uh, uh phonetically and uh, on uh, logographically or logophonetically um uh, um, um uh, it is hard to control Definitely. Exactly. That, that should be the the methodological thing to pursue, yeah. I think. Yeah. It's a very good point, actually. Yeah. Tricky stuff. Any more? Thank you, Thorsten. Thank you so much. Judith, again in the in the chat, it's worth noting that the Arhanes formula doesn't rotate signs unlike practically every other group on seals. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, I hadn't thought of hadn't thought of this. Yeah. It's the very truth. Whereas all the other formulas do very weird pyrites. And that is a question worth addressing, perhaps. <laughs> all those formulas there. Uh, anybody else? Any more questions? Andreas, fools again. Yeah, I'd just like to add uh, one more obstacle, which is might be possible in, in, in the writing systems. We know from other writing systems that sometimes the sign might be used as a logogram and sometimes as a syllable. So, um, so adding more complexity to this uh, yeah. possibility of 
dealing with different sign, sign uh, values at the same time for the same sign graph. Thorsten, did you want to comment on this? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, great. Absolutely. Yeah. Any more questions? Oh, there's Vasilis Petrakis as well. Hi, Vasilis. No more questions? Pippa? No? Esther? Hi, Esther. Cassandra? No? Okay, I think we, I, I would I would love to ask you more questions, but maybe we can have a private Zoom and... Yeah, let, let, let us, yeah. I, I think we have to have one anyway, I think. Yes, yes, it was wonderful. Thank you so much, Torsten. Very so provoking, and it really sets the agenda for new trajectories into looking at script and hieroglyphic, taking into account all the problems that we have. But these are challenges that we should welcome, right? And I think, um, we we have a path we have a way of looking at this with fresh eyes and i find that very exciting thanks to all the work that's been done in the past and in recent years roland pipa yeah, yeah. um judy thank you so much thank you Torsten. right here, right here. We'll be okay. in touch soon. Take it's care, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, we'll see you on the 13th of May with um, uh, Nicoletta Momigliano and In Search of the Labyrinth, going back into the labyrinth. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you, Torsten. Thank bye. you. Bye. bye. bye.